Hello, math fans. I'm Efim Zelmanov at the Heidelberg Laureate Forum. Looking forward to talk to Tom about math. There was a panel discussion yes. this morning on why do people hate mathematics? And I know that you have a slightly different opinion to the one that the panel presented. So I would love to hear that. Why do you think people hate mathematics? Okay. Mathematics is a prerequisite and basis for all technology and engineering courses. Therefore, all high school and middle school students and all university students are obliged to take difficult mathematical courses. Imagine that uh, music uh, is declared obligatory. Everybody has to take these courses. People will hate music. Because in order to become a student of medical school, you have to take math courses. And besides, mathematics sometimes is difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think I've heard a few people say that one of the reasons that attracts people to the subject of mathematics is precisely because it is difficult. It's that kind of struggle and that when you were the, the euphoria when you eventually overcome the struggle. Yeah, it, is, it, it is exciting. It is beautiful. Sometimes even mathematicians find it difficult. Yes, oh, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. But the problem, the reason why people hate math is that it is pushed to everybody. Mathematics is not about memorizing or reading something. It's incredibly boring. <laughs> <laughs> mathematics is about solving problems yeah. only. When you solve a problem yourself, not looking at the end of the book, oh, it is such a joy. Yeah. And did you, did you, do you remember that feeling from your I work? I remember that feeling, but you know how it is. Mm, it took me a year of frontal attack. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, you are at, when you attack a problem, you think about it 24 hours a day, at night. Yeah. You don't need paper, it's all here. I got so exhausted that when I finally put the dot, I didn't feel anything except being infinitely tired. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, the, did the excitement come later? Once you actually well, were able to There was appreciate... a lot of excitement because there were many partial results. Okay. And, uh, and then, as I got closer and closer, I understood that I was underst understood that I'm getting closer. Yeah. That practically there is no way the problem can escape. <laughs> so it kind of felt like you were hunting down the solution and Absolutely. closing it. Amazing. Okay, something else that I came across um, from your much more recent talks and, and work is um, you seem to have given a lot of presentations recently on this discussion around whether mathematics is an art or a science? I think that both. Both. It's a science and it is art. For people who are inside, it's art. Mm -hmm. If you listen to a conversation between two mathematicians, you may think that they are artists or whatever because they say this is beautiful, this is ugly, mm -hmm. and for them this is the decisive factor. Mm -hmm. We pursue beauty. <laughs> Yeah. And how do mathematicians know uh, what is beautiful, what is not? In the same way as students of musical academy know which music is beautiful. They were taught it. They listened to Mozart, Beethoven, and students of art academies, they copy paintings of great masters. Why? To develop taste. Mm -hmm. And did you, again, going back to your work on, on the Burnside problem, did you have that sense of your solution feeling like something beautiful? <laughs> or, or was it more kind of computational? No, it's it, not so computational. No. I'm not a com very computational. Hmm. I have to see some structure yeah. behind. No, I think that if you decided to work uh, on a very difficult problem that many very clever people worked on. You have to answer yourself the following question. What do I know what they did not know? Mm -hmm. Why should I solve it? 
I thought that I could answer that question that uh, I had different approach. Yeah, so did you already have the idea before you decided to try to solve the problem? Of course, because yeah, okay. you, you don't attack big problems just mm. for the heck of it. Yeah, so, so I, I guess what I'm sort of getting at is, did you think this is a big problem in the field I'm interested in? How might I attack this? Or because it was a problem in your field, you were therefore aware of it, and perhaps subconsciously it was in your mind, and then suddenly one day you, you know, without meaning to necessarily think about it, you, you were like, I've got an idea. The Burnside problem was very popular in the Soviet Union. Uh, undergraduate students knew it. Okay. So I always knew about it. Yeah. And my work was related to it, but not directly, somewhat related. I see. I see. And then I started to think that these relations get closer and closer. And that actually there is a promising way to attack mm. the problem. But it was a bit unusual because after I thought that I did it, my supervisors my, and, and friends, I remember the reaction. Maybe you should take some vacation. <laughs> <laughs> so have you since thought about the problem? Because of, I believe some aspects of the Burnside problem are still unresolved. Oh, yes. You know, every big problem uh, today, lots of lovers in his lecture said that a big problem is never solved completely. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so have you, is, that, is that something you're still actively Yes, some aspect, some okay. connection, some... Okay, and um, one of my students who is, is very interested in this area of, of maths, he, he wanted me to ask you, if I may, do you think we are close to the solution of the bounded Burnside problem? No, I don't think so. Because one needs a dramatically new idea even a supercomputer won't help because okay. uh, now some problems are algorithmically undecidable. It's not mm. clear how to do it. So you think if there is going to be a solution, it's going to require completely new thinking? New idea. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's very, it's really insightful to hear that, actually. That's, that's really interesting. Now, another question that I, I wanted to ask. Um, I actually, I think we discussed this on um, an online panel in the 2020 version of the Heidelberg Forum, mm -hmm. when of course, September 2020, everything was online. And we, um, I think I was moderating a session that you were involved with, um, and we were talking about the interaction between maths and computer science was the subject mm -hmm. of the panel. Yes. But towards the end, um, I think, being me, I think I threw out a more general question, uh, which was to ask, are there any particular um, results or, or theorems in, in mathematics that you find particularly beautiful or particularly delightful to, to see or do you really appreciate some of your favorite results or some? You know, this is such a big question. I should, uh, you know, for example, Euler's formula e to the power i pi equals negative one is incredibly beautiful. Yeah, yeah. There are many beautiful things in mathematics. Mm -hmm. How about then? Even, you know, even thinking of how my iPhone works. If you look at this crypto system mm -hmm. and all the results that it uses, including Lagrange theorem, mm -hmm. It's impressive. <laughs> yeah. But perhaps, so I completely agree with you, but it's perhaps not something where you would immediately think of beauty. Because of course beauty is, I, I think in the mathematical world, beauty is often maybe confused or it's definitely associated with simplicity. For me, golden standard of beauty is Galois theory. Galois invented finite fields. I perfectly understand why he worked on equations of degree five and all that. At that time, everybody worked on it. Mm -hmm. Why finite fields? He single-handedly developed the subject from scratch. 
when I was a student, we were taught that real world is real numbers and complex numbers. Finite fields for number theorists and algebraists. Now look, all financial transactions. Mm -hmm. uh, this subject waited for 150 years to become applied. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. Yeah, no, I, I'm, again, I'm very glad you've, you've mentioned that as that's something I'm very keen to talk about around mathematics is that lots of stuff that's considered pure or abstract, it does, it almost, almost always end up having incredible real world applications. But also when speaking of abstract, pure, applied, it all started at the beginning of 20th century. Mm -hmm. You can find precise moment when mathematics split into pure and applied. Speaking of Euler, Gauss, are they pure or applied? Nobody asked this question. Yeah. And then there was an abstract revolution in mathematics, which is understandable. But then it became pure and applied. And do you think that is a bad thing, that we now have this separation? Do you think it would be better if they were more closely aligned and there wasn't this division? Perf personally, and uh, I've been in math, many math departments and always pushed for unity. Okay, yeah, I, I would also agree. So we're on the same page. When I was um, researching ahead of this interview, I um, discovered your mathematical genealogy. Now, have you ever looked at this yourself or are you aware of this project? Probably it goes to Gauss, no? Yes. <laughs> like everybody. <laughs> ah, so this is interesting. So obviously it's, it's um, for them, anyone watching who hasn't heard of this, it takes your, um, when you were a PhD student, your mathematical father is your PhD advisor. Yeah. And then, of course, you can trace this back. Like I had two fathers. Yes, yes. And then, then <laughs> yes. And I did check both branches, and I think they both eventually lead to, <laughs> to Gauss. It seems to me, at least, that there are two or three main branches that, that appear within this tree. Um, and you are on very much on the, the Euler-Gauss side. Um, and mine, I guess, because I studied in Cambridge, goes to the Newton. None of it. Side. Not that. <laughs> exactly, yeah. No, I, I cannot complain. <laughs> um, so my question off the back of that was on the, on the Gauss side in the genealogy tree, you also get to Leibniz. And then, of course, on my side, you have the Newton. Now, this is sort of unrelated, but tangentially. For um, calculus, there are the two notations. The Newton notation um, of f prime or f dashed of x and the Leibniz notation of dy by dx. Do you have a preference? Actually, I, without thinking, I use both. Yeah. I use both, but, but <laughs> I, I think I have a preference. I think my preference would be um, dy by dx. I think I would actually go against my genealogy and side with uh, the, uh, the Leibniz side of the tree. In different but... papers, I used both. Okay. <laughs> even without giving a thought. <laughs> Okay, fine. So that was my first kind of quick fire question. Uh, second one, is zero a natural number? Well, it's a matter of convention, definition. But it's supposed to be not. Okay, so you would say you would say not unless specifically. No, some... but no, not. But if there appears a law that it, that it is included, okay. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, was maths discovered or invented? I don't know. You know how many times I heard this question? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's a very deep question which touches on one's religious... Uh, okay. You know, the, the mm -hmm. world was created or... I don't know. Okay. I'm an agnostic. Yeah. That, is, that is a very honest answer. Yeah, no, I like that. Um, and then uh, two more. Do you have a favorite number? No. No. Okay. <laughs> I like them all. <laughs> we like them all equally. Um, and final question, and I have a prop here. Uh, do you prefer blackboards or whiteboards? I'm more used to blackboards. Okay. But. Or I guess now black, it's probably blackboards, whiteboards, or tablets. <laughs> no, You're certainly talking... not tablets. <laughs> okay. But, but I'm more used to these classical boards. Yeah. There's something about the noise and the chalk for me. I'm very much yes. on the side of blackboards. Yeah. 
Okay, right, that's everything. So, Evan, um, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, of course, if you want to know more about Evan's fantastic work, you can Google his name, and many, many things will come up which will tell well, you more about, thank you. about what he's been doing. Um, and just a final message from me to say thank you for watching. Please do remember to subscribe if you've enjoyed this video, and I will see you all very soon.